Okay. So, last time we talked about an algorithm uh, for this uh, guy where we're going to walk through this one element at a time. So, as we're going through here, we're going to, so we're going to have a for loop that's going to go through every element of this string. Okay. That's step one. All right. Each time through, we're going to need to ask questions about what we're looking at. So, let, we're going to build this in little pieces. Okay. So, we're going to start off taking a string in walking through there and just displaying each thing we run into. Done it before, should be fairly boring, but let's get that base piece working, right? So we're gonna start off, so what's been our pattern or, or our lesson the last couple of classes? Break these things down into little tiny steps, right? And the more you do this, the more you'll get better at breaking it down into those little tiny steps. So even as you were working on this assignment, if you thought, well, I did break it down into tiny steps. Chances are you didn't break it down into small enough okay. steps. Okay, so we're going to keep uh, uh, going through this. So right now inside of my uh, um, expression here, I'm just going to write a loop that's going to go through the all the elements of whatever string is passed in. Okay, so first of all, just to remind you, just because I named this guy expression down here, these two variables can be named completely different things. Okay, not until I took this variable and I passed it into process expression did that guy get passed in here. And remember, variables resolve to their most local definition. So at runtime, this expr here, which is a variable, will resolve to its value. All right, so it's actually that particular string that's getting sent in here. So once it's sent into here, it didn't know that this guy used to be inside of a variable called expr. It's just a string. And I happen to be storing that string inside of the variable in here called expr. Why did I name it expr? Because I'm storing an expression. It's a variable built for storing an expression. Sounds like maybe I should call it expr or call it expression or something that's meaningful to the kind of value that's in there. Make sense? All right, so I'm just going to quickly write a little for loop that's going to go through every element that's in the expr and just display it to the screen okay proving that we are going through each element so for i in range what's the first legal bucket of expr what's the last legal bucket of expr length of expr minus one is the last legal bucket range goes only up to that right but not including it all right so uh, what's the lesson there? We do not necessarily know what value that holds. We don't know if that's a string with three elements in it, with five elements in it, with 5,000 elements in it. But how many elements are in it? The length of it are the number of elements that are in there. That's how we can deal with it generically. Make sense? All right, so each time through, we're going to print expr at bucket i take us on a voyage through that string. Fair enough? Yeah. Okay. And we'll go ahead and right now this guy, I'm printing out the answer that comes out of there, which is going to be a none because I don't actually return anything. But in the meantime, it should print out each individual character. So we'll go and run this and just prove that we are spinning through that string. So there's each of our each of our characters in our string. We're cool with that? All right, so now as we walk through the string, as we hit each individual char, we wanna ask a question. We wanna say, if it's a number, what am I going to do? I'm collecting it. If it's an operator, what am I going to do? I'm gonna potentially perform math or move on to the next number to collect, right? So I need to be able to identify numbers and I need to be able to identify operators. So why don't we write two little widgets, two little functions for doing that? Sure, we could put it into the code and have our code start looking scarier and scarier and scarier. Or I can just write a little function up here. I can say def is maybe call it is digit. Okay, and this guy is going to take in a char as a parameter, so some character. And I want to return true if that guy is a 
digit, if it's a number, if it's a zero through a nine. All right, well, I can ask the question. I can do the whole, if it's a zero, return true. If it's a one, return true. If it's a two, return true. Blah, 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 blah. Else, return false. <coughs> or I can return the string containing all of my numbers dot find char not equal to negative one. If I take the character that was passed in and I search for it in this string, if it gives me something other than negative one, that means it found it in that string. So let's say I passed in the char seven. The position of seven in this string is at bucket seven. Is it true that seven is not equal to negative one? So I'll return true, seven is a digit. If I passed in a four and I search for four inside of this string, I find it here at bucket four. Is, is it true that four is not equal to negative one? That's true. Four is a digit. Okay, so I'm returning the value that this boils down to. What if I passed in a Z or a plus sign? Where is plus sign found in that string? It's not. So this guy would boil down to negative one, not found. Remember last class I said that's a really, really important case, the whole not found thing, okay? So this would boil down to a negative one for the plus sign. Is negative one not equal to negative one? No, they're the same. They are equal to each other. So that would boil down to false. So this guy will boil down to the value of false whenever I pass it something that's not in zero through nine. It'll boil down to true when I pass it something that is in zero through nine. All right, if you don't like doing this all in one line like this, you can always wrap it in an if statement. You can say if, that's true, return true, else, return false. But do you notice the redundancy here? If this is true, return true. If this is false, return false. Couldn't I just have returned whatever this was? But if this, if you're more comfortable with writing it as an if statement like this, that's fine. Just a little, little extra redundancy, not, not going to hurt anything. Go ahead. Had we covered not equal to? Uh, I think it's, it's in the book. Okay. Um, or I mean, if you, you could say, I mean, if you wanted to do something, you could say greater than or equal to zero. Something like that. Then we would return uh, false. Otherwise, we return true. Something like that. Yeah. Um, just the the uh, uh, the Boolean literals in Python start with a capital T or a capital F. That's just how they define them. In fact, in most programming languages, it's all lowercase. All right. So this is is digit. This guy says. If the, if the thing that you passed in is found in here, in fact, I'm actually going to go back a little farther and just do the, the one-liner here. If the thing I passed in here is found in my string collection there, return true. Otherwise, return false. So this guy tests against is digit. Def is op takes in a char, this guy can return. Now we can put all the operators in here, but in our little collection, we actually only have two operators, right? Pluses and minuses. So this will return true if whatever I pass in is one of these guys. Does that make sense? And if you wanted to write it even more generically, you could write something like def 
is member of collection, pass a char, pass a, pass a collection, and return collection dot find char not equal to negative one. And then down here we would call is member of collection passing it char passing it that collection. Down here we would return is member of collection passing it char passing it that collection. So now we wrote it more generically so I can test to see if any individual character is found anywhere in any collection. So I have a nice little helper for that. And then I can say, well, here's my convenience function for digits. Here's my convenience function for operators. Now you didn't have to write these in separate functions if you didn't want to, but this was an easy problem to solve. This was an easy problem to solve. Solve a whole bunch of those easy problems. Get a bunch of little wins, right? Then you could put all those little tools together and actually solve the bigger problem. So now we're going to test our is digit and is up. And we're going to, instead of printing the value there, well, we'll go ahead and keep printing the value, but then we'll say we're going to print is up on that value. And then we'll also print is digit on that value. And make sure it's giving us the right output for whether something is an op or is a digit. Make sense? So each time, so the first time through, it's going to print out a one. Then it's going to print out a false. That guy's not an operator. Then it's going to print out a true. That guy is a digit. So here's our one. It's not an operator. It is a digit. Here's a two. Not an operator. Is a digit. Here's a three, not an operator, is a digit. Here's a plus sign, is an operator, not a digit. Here's an eight, so on and so forth. Where's our, do we have a minus sign in here? Here's a minus sign, is an operator, not a digit. All right, so we are now accurately identifying whether things are digits or operators. Okay, so let's go back to our algorithm here. So we're going to need a couple of variables here. We're going to need to keep track of the current number we're building up. We're going to have to keep track of our previous number. We're going to have to keep track of an operator, which is the most recent operator or no operator. Okay, so one of the uh, challenges for the homework is how do you represent not an operator? Right? Okay. So let's go in here. And we'll go ahead and well, I'll leave that for loop there for right now. So we're going to have kernom. We'll start that guy off as the empty string. We haven't collected anything yet. We'll have prevnum. We'll start that guy off as the empty string. And we'll have curop. And I'm going to start this guy off as like a question mark. Something other than my legal operators. Okay, because so I'm going to say question mark means I have not seen an operator yet. All right, so then we are going to go through every element of our string and we're going to ask questions. We're going to say if I'm currently looking at a number, what do I do? I add it to current up, right? So if is digit expression at bucket I, if the guy I'm currently looking at is a number, what do I do with it? I say kernum is equal to kernum concatenated with expression at bucket I. Build it up. Else, now, if it's not a number, in our world, since we assumed there were no spaces, 
If it's not a number, it must be an operator, correct? So I actually don't even need to be able to ask the question if it's an operator. <coughs> but if I want to be explicit, we'll be explicit here. I'll say elif is op expression at bucket i, then we're eventually going to potentially do math. But right now, I just want to prove that I'm building up my numbers and reading them. So what am I going to do in here? I'm going to print kernum, and then I'm just going to go ahead and empty kernum and build it up again. So what I'm expecting to get out of this is a 123 followed by an 8, followed by a 2, followed by a 114. Every time I run into a digit, build it up, build it up, build it up. As soon as I hit an operator, go ahead and print out the digit, I, well, the, the number I just built up, and then zero it out to build up the next one. This isn't what we're ultimately going to do, but we're solving little tiny steps. Can I collect numbers? Make sense? All right, so we'll go ahead and run this guy. And there's our numbers. Remember, this none thing is still because I'm printing out answer that's getting returned, so that's not part of my, that's, that's this guy right down here. I'm printing out my answer. And right now my function here does not return a value. So it boils down to none. So if I just, for the moment, if I take out that, you'll see that none is no longer there. So 123.82. Were those my numbers? Yeah. But I have one number that's left, right? Why is that? Well, if we look at this, I'm only printing out numbers when I hit operators. That means at the very end, once I'm out of this for loop, I have one last number stuck in the machine. Because I only printed out kernum when I hit an operator. As I was building up this last guy, I actually hit the end of the string, not an operator. So I had one last bit of math to do. All right, so now this will get me all of my numbers. There's my 114. That makes sense? All right, so now I feel like I'm building up numbers, collecting numbers. So far, so good. So what's gonna happen next? Well now, instead of when I see an operator just printing out the number, I wanna find out, do I do math? I'm asking the question, do I do math? When do I do math? When I hit this first plus sign, will I do math? Not yet. This is a promise for future math. But in order to do math, I need two numbers. Right? Okay, so. I can detect this a couple of different ways. I can say, if I don't currently have an operator, I don't do math yet. So, for instance, if curop is the question mark, that means that I need to store this operator, but this is the first operator I'm running into, therefore I do not have enough, I don't have enough numbers to do math yet. That's one way I can ask it. What's another way I can ask it? Ultimately, I'm doing math with these two variables, right? Kernum and prevnum. Now, we've been building up kernum here. If prevnum has nothing in it currently, that means we don't have enough to do math. So I could also ask about the length of prevnum. If prevnum has a length of zero, can't do math yet. Both of those are equivalent questions, okay? I'm basically saying, do I have enough, do I have an, uh, enough numbers to do math? First operator I run into, I have collected this number in kernum. Then I run into this guy and I'm saying, hmm, should I do math? Well, I can glance at curop and see a question mark there and that tells me, ah, can't do math yet, store my operator, move on with life, whatever that means right now. Or I can look at prevnum and say, that dude's empty, don't have enough inputs to do math, 
move on with life. Okay, so we can pick our poison. All right, so if we're looking at an operator here, we want to ask the question, can we do math? If Kurop is currently equal to a question mark. If I'm currently looking at a question mark, then what do I do? I store the operator that I just have, that is found, and move kernum into prevnum and zero out kernum to build up my next number. Make sense? So if I'm currently looking at, a, at an equal sign here, I'm sorry, or a question mark here, I'm gonna say kurop, I'm gonna set the value of that guy to the operator I just found. I'm only in this if statement if the guy I'm currently looking at is an operator. So, curop will be equal to expression at bucket i. Make sense? All right, so I'm storing that curop for next time when I can do some math. Then, I'm gonna set prevnum equal to kernum. So I'm just gonna shift that guy over to the next number. Then I'm going to set kernum equal to the empty string. Reset him so I can start building up my next number. So far, so good. That's what we're doing if we see an operator, but we can't do math yet. And if you want to ask the question the other way, we can say if the length of num is equal to zero. That also means we can't do math yet. Those are equivalent questions to ask. Right? Just like in real life, you know, you can maybe get to the same conclusion based on asking two, two or three or five million different questions. Right? But I like this Karop one. This is the first operator I'm bumping into. I don't have enough numbers yet. But they give us the same conclusion, right? Okay, so if I can't do math yet, let's set ourselves up for collecting another number so that we can do math later, do math soon. So I'll overwrite Kurop with the operator I just read. I will set prev number equal to the number we just finished building up. Because when I bump into an operator, when I hit this guy right here, that also tells me I have finished building up that number. Right? Okay. So I'll go ahead and put prevnum equal to the guy I just finished building up. Then I'll empty out kernum so I can build up the next guy. Else. That means I can do math. Okay, so this guy right here says, can't do math yet. This else says, ready to do math. That's what that guy says. Okay, and if I'm going to do math, what am I doing math with? The current value of kernum, the current value of prevnum, and the current value of operator. Okay. Now, you can put all that scary stuff right here, or we can go write a function that does some math. We'll come up here, we'll run over to Home Depot, we'll buy a little function here called do math. This guy will take num1, num2, and an operator. All right, now we can either assume these are strings. We happen to know that our two values are stored as strings. So why don't we call this guy num string one, num string two? That'll remind us that we actually need to convert these guys into numbers inside of here to perform that operator. Okay? So I'll just make it explicit. I'll just create two variables in here. So I'll say num one is equal to the int version of num string one. We'll say num two is equal to the int version of num string two. Whoop. I think you're better than me. 
All right, then we'll ask the question, which operator am I looking at? If op is equal to the plus sign, return num1 plus num2. LF op is equal to the minus sign. Now, in our current logic, since it can only be positive or negative, we probably would actually just say else return num1 minus num2. That makes sense? Now, in the minus case, we do need to be careful that we pass the numbers in the right order. All right? Because in the example, let's just assume our first number here was, this was a minus. What I'm actually doing is I'm saying this guy minus this guy. Well, depending on how I call that function, when I actually call the do math function, this guy will be stored inside of prevnum. <coughs> this guy will be stored inside of kernum. That makes sense? Okay, so if that's the case, then I need to either pass those numbers that direction, pass it prevnum first, pass it kernum second, and that won't hurt us for addition, correct? Or I need to name my variables the other way so that they come in, I do the math the right way. So I either have to pass them in the right order or I need to take them in the order I'm passing them. Let me show you that to you as an example. So if I'm doing math here, so ready to do math, right now I've written this function as num1 plus num2 or num1 minus num2. The math I'm going to do is, so I'm going to say do math right now, we'll decide where to put it here in a, in a minute. So we'll say do math and I'm going to pass it kernum, I'll pass it prevnum, and I'll pass it kerop. So kernum's coming in as num string one, prevnum is coming in as num string two. As I currently have it written, I'm actually passing them backwards. Because if I were to do subtraction, this is gonna say kernum minus prevnum. So if this was our original subtraction, let's just assume this was a subtraction here, this would say eight minus 123, which is going to give us the wrong result. Does that make sense? So I have two options. I can either pass them in the right order, now we're fixed, or I can pass them in the order I was passing them before and just make sure I flip-flop the do math guys up here. So this is num string two, this is num string one, and life goes on. So you can choose, just make sure you're doing math in the right order. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead, I'm just gonna pass them in the correct order. So I'll pass it prevnum, and then I'll pass it kernum, and I'll pass the operator that we're doing. Now ultimately, this guy is going to be giving us back the result right now as a number. I'm gonna go ahead and have it give us the result as a string. Or I can convert it to a string here. Either way, okay? Now, where am I putting my answer? <laughs> Which variable do I use to build up my number each time? Kernum. So I'm probably not going to be putting my answer there. Put it in prevnum. Okay, so prevnum is going to kind of keep track of my running total as I'm going. Okay. So I'll go ahead and I'll say prevnum is equal to the string version of what do math returns. Make sense? 
Okay, so that's going to be the string version of what do math returns. Then, now remember, the reason I'm even in this if statement, this if else, is because I saw an operator. If it's the first operator I saw, I'm just going to record it. Otherwise, I'm doing math based on the previous operator I had found. So this was not the operator I just found. This was the operator I found a little bit ago. Now I just used that operator with my current two numbers. So now I can go ahead and set curop equal to expression at bucket I. So go ahead and overwrite the operator I just used with my new operator. Then I can set kernum equal to the empty string, ready to go do some more math or build up another number. Go ahead. Because I'm only in this else here, if I'm currently looking at an operator. So we do this, so I'll switch this back to the plus sign. So I write in this guy that's in kernum, then I hit an operator, right? So because my cur op is a question mark, I will store that plus sign, I'll overwrite the question mark with the plus sign, and I'll move the 123 to prevnum and zero out kernum. Then I built up the eight inside of Kerna. Then I hit another operator. Now, because I already have an operator inside of Kerop, I'm going to do the math of 8 plus 123, or 123 plus 8. doesn't matter in that case, but I'm doing the math that was previously designed. Then I'm going to overwrite Kerop with the minus sign because that's the next math I'm going to do. Does that make sense? I don't want to reset it, otherwise I'll ignore this operator. Okay, so if it's the first operator, store it, move on. Otherwise, move the, well, otherwise, do some math storing the result in prevnum, storing the string result in prevnum, since we're storing strings. Then, overwrite curop with the op we just found, because we've already used the previous op to do our math, then empty out kernum so we can build up our next number. All right, then we're back to the races. So we just did this math here. So now we have a 131 stored in prevnum, and we have a minus stored in curop. Now we start building up the two. I finally hit another operator. That gets us onto this else. What do I do? I do the math. So I say 131 minus a 2, which gives me a 129 stored inside of prevnum. Then I overwrite cur op with the plus sign I just found. And I zero out cur num. Go back up. Keep trucking. I build up the 114, blah, blah, blah. I never hit another operator though. So what happens? I don't get into this code the very last time. That makes sense? So now I want to find out, do I do math? Now for right now, I'm just going to assume that we will do math and then we'll see what the problem with that could be. So. Once I've exited this for loop, all right, that means I've run out of characters to look at. I have one last, th well, potentially have one last thing to deal with. Right now, we're going to assume we do. We have a final number stuck in kernum. We have a final number stuck in prevnum, and we have a final operator. So. I'll go ahead and, well, we can return it if we want. I'll say return do math prevnum kernum curop. My final math I have to do. 
and I'm not converting it to a string because we were processing a expression. I might as well have the number now. All right, I don't need to store them back in kernum or prevnum. I'm, I'm done. So I'll return that final answer. That's where I'll print it right here. And there's our 243. So now I understand why you were saying it was too easy. It was, was the problem hard or was it hard to break it down into the small steps? We noticed the pattern here. I keep saying that the reason programming is hard to learn is because we're too good at problem solvers and we have trouble breaking them down into the small steps. We have trouble articulating how we solve problems. Okay. I'm not trying to teach you Python. Python's easy. It's just the syntax for representing this crap. I'm trying to get you to break the problems down into tiny, tiny little steps. If you think you can write a little widget to do something, do it. All right, now let's break our code. Now, if, if yours worked for stuff like this, that's fine, but good enough, all right? This should work for any series of mathy stuff. If I go ahead and just take this off, it'll work for this still. If I, you know, I don't know, do a minus here and just like that, we're still fine, all right? But where it'll break is if I do this. Now, you could say, well, that's okay for it to break because technically you just gave it a number. There was no operators in there, right? So, if I give you the expression one, two, three, the assumption would be it's the number 123. That's the answer. Okay, that's, that's the math answer, right? So, right now, I'm doing math regardless. Now, if I do, here, let's just... Give me a second here. I'm going to print out none, but you're going to see it won't crash this time. Okay? So, everything that's happening up here is cool, right? All that stuff is, is working just fine. The issue I'm running into is what I did is I just built up Kernum. That's it. So, prevnum is still empty her op is still question mark. I don't actually have math to do. So if I have a situation where I have a, just a single number stored, what am I going to do with it? I'm just going to convert it to an int. So I'll ask a little question down here. Just like before, I can ask it two different ways. If her op is equal to the question mark, return int version of current up else return do math so I'm not going to just you know haphazardly do some math when I might not have a previous number or an operator to work with because in this case I don't There's my 123. And we can tell we have real, these are real values. If I say plus five in there, I'll get 128. It's not a string. If it was a string, I would have gotten one, two, three, uh, eight. Um, actually, it would have failed because uh, Python doesn't let you concatenate ints and strings. All right, so questions about this. Go ahead. Can you explain a little bit the difference between ELIF and ELSE, like in like situations where it's even if? Like yeah, so, well, if we're going to use whenever we have to ask a question. ELIF we use if we want to ask a second question. Like, if this was false, is there a, is there a backup question that I want to ask that I might want to... And I could say I could have 50 LFs if I want. 
So if this is true, do this. Else if this is true, do this. Else if this is true, do this. So when I say L if like this, it's the same thing as saying else if. All right, it's the same thing as that. But what will end up happening is you'll have just nesting and nesting and nesting, so it'll get really disorganized. Then my else is a catch-all. So in here, if I'm in my uh, um, uh, this else if, I'm saying if I'm looking at an operator. Now, I actually could have written this just as else, just like that. And the reason for it is I happen to know if I'm not looking at a digit, I must be looking at an operator. So I asked the question there just to be explicit so you would physically see or visually see I'm seeing an op. But we'll see that this code works the same if I change this to just an else. That's my only alternative to a number is a operator in my current state of things. All right, because I said we're going to assume we don't have spaces. That makes sense? So that guy still works. Now, I could say with the LF like that, it's either a, uh, I'm sorry, wrong LF, this guy down here. If it's a digit, if it's an op, so elif if is op of my expression at bucket i like that. If I'm looking at an operator, do all this stuff. Now, with that, if I'm looking at a space, for example, I'm just going to ignore it and do nothing. So now my code will work for things like that. Oh, I was throwing extra LFs in here. Okay, so now it ignores spaces effectively. So I'm specifically saying, if it's a digit, do this. If it's an operator, do this. If it's anything else, do nothing. Yeah. If you have an if statement, and that if statement is true, will it do the elif under it? No. No. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you only get into you only get to respond to one of your questions. So in that case, if this is true, mm -hmm. it will not even ask this question. Oh, okay. But if you want it to, you just change it to a regular if. To a regular if. Yep. Yeah, if you wanted to definitely ask both questions, you would turn it into that. Okay. Then it'll ask every question. Yep. All right, other questions? What if you wanted to have a net start to your string with a negative? Like minus 12. Okay, so you wanted to support digits that had negative numbers in it. Okay, well, how would you solve that? Because... This actually becomes an interesting question from the perspective of now we have a minus associated with a number. We also have a minus as an operator. Now at the same time, what's the difference between, let's yeah. just take the spaces out here. How could we tell the difference between those? Okay, so if I'm currently building up a number, that is kernum, is nothing and I run into a minus sign that means that ah that must be the sign of that number but if I run into this minus sign and kernum is actually a thing then this must be an operator Does that make sense um, so you actually could differentiate them and then when you pass it in you'd have to pass in the sign of that number when you do math you'd have to pass in the sign of your numbers for running into them. Now, where things get even in, more interesting is what if I do minus negative five? Well, you know, this is minus, yeah, I guess it would turn, you would turn it into a plus. So if you had two of these guys together, you could treat it as a plus, or you could try to identify this first minus as being subtraction, 
and the second minus here being a uh, um, uh, being the negative sign. And in order to test for that, what you'd have to do is as soon as you read in this op, you would then have to make sure you cleared out current up to build up the next one. Then you can ask the question about this guy if Kernum is empty. So right after you consume your single operator and do whatever you're supposed to do related to that single operator, you would clear out Kernum. And then when you hit this next operator, Kernum's currently empty and you'd be able to deal with the sign. Does that kind of make sense how that would work? Yeah, so a couple, other, couple extra things you have to keep track of. So that's kind of a, um, I think kind of a fun one. All right, any other questions? Go ahead. So for the expression, could you write like an input statement and with always the use of the input like a, you know, expression? Like yeah, yeah, we just hard coded it here, but okay. you could have certainly asked the user enter in something that's legal here. Okay. All right, so for Wednesday, I'll put up a, uh, another program to do. Um, uh, I have to think about what I want that to be, but it'll be something you know, along these lines, but something that's going to force you to break things down into small pieces. All right, so for right now, I'll go ahead and I'll put this solution um, up so you have access to this. And then on Wednesday, we will go through and talk about the uh, midterm, which will be on Friday. Uh, and then I'll, I'll go ahead and announce it now, but um, just in case I forget, but the Monday right after break, I won't be here for this class. I don't get back till later that day. Um, so I'll give you something impossible to do that day. But, um, but if you, so what I'm really saying is, is if you were coming, if this is your only class today and you were going to come back to be in class on Monday, you get one extra day officially. All right. So I'll, I'll, I won't give you anything that's due that day during class. So don't expect me to be there that Monday because my flight doesn't get in in time. All right. So I'll put uh, this uh, code up, I will uh, uh, upload the video, and I'll put some assignment up here in about an hour or something like that. I'll try to make it harder than this one since there were so many complaints about this being too easy. I did not think this was too easy. Most people didn't. I'm just, I was just giving them a hard